Fabulous Histories and Mysteries Uncovered. I'm Jessica. And I'm Kyle. And on this week's episode, Kyle is going to be talking about an individual named Mikhail Popkov, or he was known as the werewolf. Ooh. <laughs> and I am going to be talking about serial killer William Bonin and just trigger warning, it involves children. I'm so sorry. It's your turn to bring us down, is it? Yes. No. I'm assuming you bring us down too. Always. 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 <laughs> Perfect. Okay. You're more truly filling in for Ashley. <laughs> Good. Good to know. <laughs> okay. All right. Take it away, babe. Okay. So my source is what I will mention first this time. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning. Uh, Wikipedia, Murderpedia, and all that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Jessica's favorite. My favorite. They should sponsor me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> all right. So Mr. Mikhail Popkov was born in 1964 in, and sorry for this, Norilsk. Krasonyarsk, Krai, and soon moved to Angarsk, Urktusk. Urkutsk. Urkutsk. Okay, it's spelled I R K U T S K. We're doing our best. It's a Russian story. We're so sorry. As always. Uh, this was when Russia was actually referred to as the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. So this would be mere, very much more communism style. Uh, and as Jessica said, he was known as the werewolf. Oh, it's good. This Halloween episode, right? Because we're getting in October. And the Angarsk maniac. Beautiful pronunciations, babe. Thank you. I try <laughs> so hard. All right. So I like the last one. There's not much about his childhood and even his personal life for that matter. Uh, it was believed that his mother was an alcoholic and abusive. As they all are. Uh, seems like there's always something, right? Uh, he had a wife named Elena, as well as a daughter named Ekaterina. Ekaterina. Yeah. He would later accuse his wife of infidelity uh-huh. and blamed his brutality on what was found out to be a false accusation. Oh, of course it was. It was why dead. Why would you beat your wife for something that's real and not something that's totally false? And he was probably the one that was cheating. No, sorry. No? Not exactly. How do you know? Well, I read the story. Oh. <laughs> I researched it. <laughs> also, side note, our daughter's middle name is Katarina. Mm. And I just love the middle. I just love the name Ekaterina. It's just so beautiful. Such a beautiful name. They have such beautiful names there. Yes. Yes, they do. So. Ivan. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, his wife actually provided him alibis for when he needed them. So, you know. Getting that whole uh, Stockholm Syndrome problem. Oh. Yeah. So Mikhail Popkov was actually a former policeman in the Urkutsk region, which is in Siberia. So I'll probably use that word from now on. He also spent time as a security guard for an oil and chemical company and for another private firm. Oh, just the job we want him to be yes. doing. Security. Oh. So from 1992 to 2010, uh, Popkov killed... Is that how you say the year? 2010. <laughs> I like 2010 better, personally. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. That's how I say it again. Because he's old. Gen X is not that old. <laughs> You're old. <laughs> uh, old-ish. You really are like the perfect Ashley replacement. Really? They're both old, and <laughs> you wow. both use Wikipedia as a source. <laughs> you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> Put your arm back around me. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> you're old. <laughs> yeah, it's uncomfortable and starting to strain something. It's so bad. So, <laughs> between 1992 to 2010. Yeah, 2010. Let's go with that one. Uh, Pop killed women between the ages of 16 and 14. Oh, that's not good. So not as old as I am, but up there anyway. Oh, that's not good. Uh, as well as actually a policeman in his hometown of Angarsk. Oh, that's not good. No. That's no. a bad man. Yeah. So his target was uh, women who were involved in immoral acts in public, Mm -hmm. like going to parties without male chaperones, or women he believed needed to be cleansed from the streets to make it a better place. I would have been a goner back in these times. 1992? I wasn't even born. (laughs) Yeah, a year later. No, but I'm saying if I was like in those times... 
you are in when, those like, times. Serial killers ran rampant. I I used to be like a partier. Mm-hmm. Pretty immoral. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> I'll hear all these stories later. It's good to know now after marriage. That's great. Yeah, child. Yeah. Now yeah, you're telling podcast. me. Tell me now. <laughs> you have a podcast together. <laughs> Filling in for Ashley, and this is how I find out. Ashley, what do you know that I don't? It's a little paradigm, Charlie. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Keep going. All right. <laughs> So his tactics for luring victims uh, is he would drive around at night while dressed in his police uniform, find a victim that he liked, offered them a ride in his police car. But of course, instead of taking them home, he would drive them to remote locations. Uh, just a bit of a trigger warning is some of the torture and murder techniques. Um, there was also some conflicting information between Wikipedia and all that's interesting in this one. So one source had him sexually assaulting, then murdering. And the other had him murder them first and then sexually assault him. He was referred to as a necrophilic in both. So I'm going to say the second one's probably more likely. Yeah. So apparently he would force the women to disrobe first. Then he would proceed to murder his chosen victims with regular (laughs) tools. They included knives, axes, baseball bats, screwdrivers, and not the vodka and orange juice one. After he completed the murder, he would rape their lifeless bodies. It's not fun. I don't like any of that. And I don't know which one is worse. Uh, Yeah, that's a good question. Right? It's gross either way. It's horrifying to think. Like, it's horrifying with a knife or an axe. But imagine a baseball bat. And then screwdrivers. I can only think of them going through your eyeball. And that just gives me the heaps and the jeebs. And I don't enjoy it. Yeah. Why are people so messed up? That's a good question. Why, Kyle? I don't know. Tell me. I can tell you the one exception was the policeman that he murdered wasn't sexually assaulted. That makes you feel better. It doesn't. I know. Okay. Good try. I know. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So (laughs) in a quote from Popkoff himself to justify his strange and awful murders was, the victims were unaccompanied by men at night without a certain purpose and behaving carelessly who are not afraid to get into my car and go for a drive in search of adventures. For the sake of entertainment, ready to drink and have sex, not all women became victims, but those of a certain negative behavior. I had a desire to teach and punish. Yeah, so that's never good. Uh, So let's see. One of the instances was Popkoff's murdering a teacher at his daughter's school. Oh, great. Yeah, she was later found in the woods with another victim of his. Ugh. Yeah, he once realized he left a police identification token, which may have been a badge, I'm not 100% sure, where the bodies of Maria Lizina, 35, and Lilia Paskovza, sure, 37. Uh, When he went back to find it, he found the token, as well as one of the victims still breathing. Uh, He was shocked and decided to to finish her with a shovel. Oh! Yeah. Uh Oh! That's also a horrible way to go. That's, yeah, not a good way. So by the year 2000, it is believed the murder spree ended when Popkoff became impotent and contracted syphilis. <laughs> Sucker. But investigators believed it went well into the year 2010. Thanks, Kyle. You're welcome. <laughs> During the investigation in the mid-90s, with testimonies from surviving victims, oh. yeah, and uh, many inquiries, Popkoff was able to elude the police for 20 years. Through these investigations, they did find a pattern. Uh, the tracks to the dumping spots were made by a Lada 4x4. What's a Lada? A Lada is a terrible Russian vehicle. And if you ever want to see one, you can just Google it. L-A-D-A. Yeah. Yeah. They're very Russian, to say the least, which means they probably only worked half the time. <laughs> uh, this is an off-road vehicle used by the police specifically. And that was stupid of him. Yeah, this led the police to believe that the murderer is one of their own. Yeah, that was really dumb of him. No, they were a regular vehicle out there, but yes, they did use them quite extensively. So from this, the police did an extensive DNA testing of 3,500 current and former policemen in Urkutsk. This was what it took to finally capture Popkov in 2012. 
He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for 22 murders and two attempted murders. Good. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, good. Oh, like in a good way? Yeah. Oh. It depends on your point of view. Oh. So after two years in prison, Popkov decided to confess to 59 more murders. Well, that's not good. Yeah. Oh. The victim at this t- victim count at this time would put him ahead of other famous Russian serial killers, Andrei Chikatilo and Alexander Puchuskin. On December of 2018, after another trial, Popkov was convicted of a further 56 <gasps> murders. What? This is out of the 59. Oh. And then the other three did not have enough evidence to convict them. So out of the 59 he'd admitted to, 56 were convicted. Wow. That's yeah. still crazy. Oh, yeah. And and then in 2020, Popkov confessed to another two murders. And that brings his total of admitted murders oh to my God. 83. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a lot. And so we'll do a final quote for him, because why not? So in the quote from a jailhouse interview, he said, I was born in another century. Now there's such modern technologies, methods, but not earlier. If we have not caught to that level of genetic examination, then I would not be sitting in front of you. Ew. So just think about that. He would have been getting away with it like crazy if it wasn't for DNA testing. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Imagine how many people have gotten away with it because there hasn't been genetic testing. I know. That's yeah. crazy. That's very crazy. Wow. Yeah, I mean, 3,500 people had to supply a DNA test to find him. Oh. So that's, uh, that was insane. It's a lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And 83 is definitely a record that you don't want to break. No. Yeah. I hope nobody breaks that record. No. Well. Okay. So you're down. Now thanks. we're going to go further. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Are you a hot mess? I'm a hot mess. <laughs> Ashley's favorite word is hot mess. And I have adopted it and my husband like Kyle teases me about it all the time. Hi, your husband Kyle? My husband Kyle. <laughs> Hi, Kyle. Yes. Okay, Kyle. Yes. Sir. Do you want to hear my story? I absolutely do. Yeah? Yes, I do. Okay, listeners, I hope you also want to hear my story. Uh he's been on my list for a while. So, I'm going to be talking about William Bonin. He was a victim of both child molestation and a dysfunctional household. Like we said, pattern, isn't it? Yes, always a pattern. Nine times out of ten, I find that it's a pattern. He was the middle of three brothers, and on January eighth, nineteen forty-seven, William George Bonin was born in Connecticut. He was mostly nurtured by his grandfather, who was a convicted child molester. Really. Yep, because he had an alcoholic father and an absent mother when he was growing up. My God. Yes. So out of all the three, the child molester gets him? Yeah. Would have rather had the alcoholic have him at that point. I know. That is just awful. Yeah. So he did not have a chance. A chance at all. <clears throat> at the age of eight, he fled his home. And in other parts, I heard that it was earlier or that he was set up in foster care. So I'm not really sure, but there's some conflicting information. And at the beginning of his adolescence, he was booked into a juvenile jail facility for stealing license plates. That is weird. Isn't that random? What would you do with a license plate? No idea. I mean, you don't steal the car, just steal the plate. Right? Just a little odd. Maybe it was just like him trying to see what he could get away with. Or he's dim. That, no, he's not actually. Oh, he was? He's not. Yeah. He's actually really smart. That's scary. I know. So I'm not really sure what his plan was. Maybe his plan was to eventually steal a car and then you'd have all these license plates and nobody would be able to find them. That Uh, makes sense. Who knows? That would have been a good idea. He is said to have been sexually molested by other adolescent boys while he was being held in the detention facility. Oh, that is always wrong. Or at the foster orphanage. I don't know. Like I said, conflicting information. He joined the U.S. Air Force in 1965, so when he was 20. So no mental check on that one, eh? No. And participated in the Vietnam War as a helicopter gunner. He also assaulted, or sexually assaulted, two troops who were under his command where he was enlisted. He also got married, got divorced, and then he moved to California after the war. Wow. that uh, That's quite a little piece of... You know, history. Yep. A little piece of his life. Goodness. 
He was detained for sexually assaulting five adolescent boys in the South Bay region in 1969 when he was just 22 years old. God. On top of that, he was charged with oral copulation, four charges of sodomy, five crimes of kidnapping, and one case of child molestation. Wow. I mean, child molestation is bad, but the other ones definitely have them beat. Those are awful. In exchange for his admission to the Atascadero State <laughs> Hospital for the Criminally Insane, Bonin pleaded guilty to molestation. He was then subjected to intensive mental testing while he was in that facility, and it was discovered that he had a remarkable IQ of 121. Yeah, this is during a time when they believe electroshock therapy was a brilliant idea for fixing the mentally insane. Yeah. So, you know, he might be smart. But... He was also given a bipolar diagnosis. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> there it is. He also had significant prefrontal brain injuries, which is thought to have affected his capacity to control violent urges. He was a 121 IQ out of this, huh? Yeah. That's weird. He had significant scars on his head and butt, oh. according to physical testing, Ew. which is not great no. considering his history. Yeah. yeah. It's it's really sad, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was. They say that monsters are created, right? Yeah. Prison officials pronounced Bond an unfit for therapy later that year as a result of his coercive sex with male detainees. Nevertheless, on June 11th, 1974, he was somehow judged to be no longer a risk to health and safety of others. So he was freed from jail. Who decided that? Honestly, in all of these cases that we've done over the years, it they're always released. And they're always a pillar of com the community or like uh, like expert behavior, best behavior in jail, and then they're released. Then they kill a bunch of people. Yeah, there's not a pattern there either. No, I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it either. In 1974 or 75, again, there's some conflicting information. Following his discharge, he sexually assaulted David McVicker, who was 14 years old. Bonin was sent back to prison for a further four years right away. Wow. Couldn't even get out the door, huh? Yeah. <laughs> when it came to it, David McVicker actually testified in court against him. Good for him. Yeah. Very brave. Yeah. Very, very brave. He said he had set the gun on his left hand side, but he already locked the door on the right. So I couldn't get out without reaching around and grabbing the door. So I knew that by that time that I did, he could easily grab the gun and shoot me. He started taking off his clothes and told me to take off mine. He was raping me in the front seat of the car, and he had a T-shirt around my neck with the, with a tire iron through the sleeve. Sorry, everybody. And he was twisting it, trying to strangle me. Oh, my God. How horrifying. A 14-year-old boy. And he was brave enough to testify after that. That's, yeah. That's impressive. And, of course, you could all get out of that that he was let go which is wonderful but also sad yes probably traumatizing for many years unfortunately exactly in 1979 william bonin was given his second parole from prison because why not yeah. and made a promise to himself to never get caught again and so as we can all guess this unfortunately led to a rise in the level of violence, and Bonin started killing his juvenile victims. Of course, you can't leave a witness now. Yeah. Goodness. However, he didn't commit these murders alone, as he had four accomplices. Vernon Butts. Really? That's his last name? Yep. Oh, my God. Gregory Miley, James Monroe, and William Pugh. That's that, four accomplices. Yeah, that's horrible. So after his release, he moved to a place called Downey. And after some time, he got a job driving trucks and started seeing a girl. Oh. He also got to know Everett Frazier, who was his neighbor in Downey. And he started going to gatherings that Frazier hosted at his place. Oh, so now he's becoming the pillar of the community and the wonderful neighbor that everybody loves. Yeah. Uh. 
It was here that he met and got to know Gregory Matthews Miley, who had an IQ of 56. Wow. And he was a native of Texas. And Vernon Butts, a manufacturing worker and occasional magician who apparently also slept in a coffin. This is getting to be quite the group, isn't it? <laughs> this, is wild. this is fascinating and terrifying. It gets better. Oh, goodness. When Monroe met Bonin, he was a homeless teenager who had been ejected from his Michigan home. Oh. He was seeking work while he was living on Hollywood's streets. On May 28th, 1980, Bonin appeared while driving a blue Chevrolet Chevette. Is it a Chevette? Yes, it is. And it's a terrible car. So I'm amazed anybody would have gotten in with him. My husband's a mechanic. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. And he approached Monroe. The New York Times claims that West Hollywood's gay scene is where Bonin also established his acquaintances. That makes sense. Back then, he was characterized by many of the young guys as possessing and mesmerizing, and that gave him the power to rule over them and control them. Don't you find those guys always like charismatic? Always charismatic, always that's how they get you. They just have it, it's a confidence, which isn't great, yeah, which is weird because they're probably like very self conscious, oh, probably, yeah. So it's just very odd. In his van, Bonin would routinely scour neighborhoods and highways in search of male prostitutes to pick up and bring home. Although they recall hearing spine-chilling cries emanating from the Bonin residence, his neighbors chose not to notify the police. Oh, yeah, that's normal. Yeah. I hear that a lot in our neighborhood. We're in a good neighborhood. I know. (laughs) They scream, but it's for partying. Yes. Lots of parties in our neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Marcus Grabs, a 17-year-old German exchange student, was his first murder victim. On August 5th, 1979, Marcus was last spotted hitchhiking along the Pacific Coast Highway. A few days later, his naked body was discovered in Malibu Canyon, where he had been stabbed nearly 80 times with a nylon rope around his neck. That is an excessive amount of anger there. Mm -hmm. 80 times. Yeah. Wow. And just for a glimpse at the geographic location, Google, Google Maps told me that the distance between those two places is almost five hours. That is a long drive. So it also could be depending like where it happened on the Malibu coast versus the canyon. And Well, the question is, did he carry the dead body for five hours or did he do it when he got there? Yeah. That's uh... Yeah. Donald Hyden, a Hollywood teenager who was 15 years old, was found dead and dismembered in a dumpster on August 27th. Also, he's moving up, is he? He had been raped, strangled, and his throat had been cut. My goodness. David Murillo, 17, who vanished on September 9th while en route to the movies, suffered the same fate. His sodomized and disfigured body was discovered three days later. Wow, this guy's escalating in the worst way possible. Horrible. It's horrifying. I could not even imagine what these poor parents are going through. Oh, no kidding. Many of the deceased, including James McCabe, were young children. In March 1980, 12-year-old McCabe was waiting for a bus that would take him to Disneyland. But unfortunately, he was kidnapped, beaten, strangled, and dumped in the trash. My God, that's terrible. You're on your way to the happiest place on Earth. And this is what happens, too. Yeah, the exact reverse of that. Yeah. Horrifying. Horrifying. Most of Bonin's victims were sexually raped and strangled with their own T-shirts, which the killer tightened around their necks with a metal bar. His body count increased until authorities apprehended one of his collaborators, William Pugh, who admitted to reportedly just observing the murders. Oh, yeah, of course. He's innocent. The police promptly placed Bonin under surveillance as a result of Pugh's statements. Well, at least they took some action. Yeah, thankfully. On June 11th, 1980, William Bonin departed in his van and made five stops to speak with young boys. One young man eventually agreed to be transported with him. Bonin was apprehended by police while sodomizing the 15-year-old victim. They discovered a length of white nylon cable, several knives, and a sizable scrapbook of news articles on the freeway killer in his van. Oh, goodness. That's terrible. This always makes me wonder if that's why parents always said, don't go in that strange van. Might be this guy. That's horrible. I'm so scared for our child. No kidding. 
On November 4th, 1981, he was found guilty and given the death penalty. Nice. And as the first person to get a fatal injection in California, he went down in history. Yeah. It's like the worst reason. Yeah. I should remember that. No. On his last day, he spent this time with friends before being led into the death watch cell in the late afternoon. He ordered three pints of coffee ice cream, two big pepperoni and sausage pizzas, and three packs, three six packs, cheese with Murphy, of Coca-Cola for his final meal. I don't know why you would need that much Coca-Cola. Well, if you're going to go out, I guess he wants to go out bloated. I guess. The warden and the Catholic chaplain paid Bonin a visit in the course of the evening. His last words were that I feel that death penalty is not an answer to the problems at hand, that I feel it sends the wrong message to the youth of the country. Young people act as they see other people acting instead of as people tell them to act. And I would suggest that when a person has a thought of doing anything serious against the law, that before they did, that they should go to a quiet place and think about it seriously. So a man that never took his own advice, perhaps? Yeah. Even though he's in prison in a quiet place. Yeah. And he was executed on February 23rd, 1996. Oh, you were just turning three that year. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> he was given the death penalty in 81 and he was executed in 96. That's a long wait. That's a long wait. Two of the freeway killers accomplices died with Vernon Butts killing himself while awaiting trial and Gregory Miley dying in prison from injuries sustained in an attack. Yeah, no surprise. Those guys don't usually survive long. No, I'm surprised he's, like, Bonin survived as long as he did, honestly. I think because he got the death penalty, they wouldn't put him with anybody else. Yeah. James Monroe is currently serving a 15-year-to-life sentence for second-degree murder for his involvement in one of William Bonin's murders. And William Pugh, on the other hand, was sentenced to six years in prison for voluntary manslaughter, but was released after only four and it was probably because of his testify of his testimony. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> William Bonin officially murdered 14 teenage boys and unofficially killed up to 21, though some say the real total is 36 or even higher. Oh my goodness, and they're all young kids too. Yeah. Oh. So, it was really hard for me to find a good um timeline that involved all of his victims. So I found a list of his victims, and I'm hoping that it's in order. And I'm just going to kind of go through and explain what happened to each of them, because I think that they need to be known. Remembered. And and remembered. Yeah. Yeah. So Thomas Glenn Lundgren was 13. He disappeared and was found on May 28th, 1979 in Los Angeles County, emasculated, bludgeoned, stabbed, his throat slashed and fatally strangled. You definitely have a second trigger warning before this group, right? Yeah. Mark Dwayne Shelton was 17. He disappeared on August 4th, 1979, found on August 11th of that year in St. Bernardino County. Bernardino. Bernardino? But there's an R there. Yeah, Bernardino. Oh. I don't know. That's what I thought it was. He was sodomized with various objects and unintentionally killed after he went into shock, which is just horrifying. Yes. This is all horrifying. Sorry. Marcus Alexander Grabs was 17. He was uh, disappeared on August 5th, found the next day in Los Angeles, sodomized, beaten, and fatally stabbed 77 times or 88 times, whichever it was. Again conflicting information from everybody it's horrible either way yeah donald ray hyden who was 15 he disappeared and was found on august 27th 1979 in los angeles he was stabbed in the neck and genitals strangled and fatally bludgeoned that's terrible then we have david luis mario was 17 he disappeared on september 9th 1979 was found on September 10th, 1979 in Los Angeles. He was raped, bludgeoned, and fatally strangled. Then there was Robert Christopher Wierostek, who was 18, disappeared on September 17th, 79, and found on September 27th, 1979 in Orange County. He was raped and strangled to death with ligature after being assaulted with a tire iron. Oh. 
This one is Kern County's John Doe, who is between the age of 15 to 27. His body was found on November 1st, 1979 in Kern County. He was strangled with ligature and died from penetration of the head with an ice pick. Boy, this guy's really trying just about everything, isn't he? That's terrible. I don't like telling these stories, people. I'm so sorry. Yes. Frank Dennis Fox was 17. He disappeared on November 30th, 79, and was found on December 2nd, 79, in Orange County. He was raped and fatally strangled with ligature after going into shock from sodomy. John Frederick Frederick Kilpatrick was 15. He disappeared on December 5th, 1979, and found on December 13th, 1979, in Los Angeles. He was strangled to death with ligature after being flagellated with string. What's flagellated? I don't know. I don't know if it's what I think it is or not. That basically means that he was just whipped. So, not nice. No, that's very not nice. Michael Francis McDonald was 16. He disappeared and was also found on January 1st, 1980 in San Bernardino County. He was mutilated and strangled to death with ligature after being assaulted. Charles Dempster Miranda was 15, disappeared and found on February 3rd, 1980 in L.A. County. He was raped, beaten, and fatally strangled with a tire iron. James Michael McCobb was 12. He disappeared and was found on February 3rd, 1980 in L.A., He was raped, beaten, his neck was crushed by a tire iron, and he was fatally strangled with his own t-shirt. Man, that's excessive. Ronald Craig Gatlin was 18. He disappeared on March 14th, 1980, and was found on March 15th, 1980 in L.A. He was sodomized with an ice pick and fatally strangled. Oh. These poor boys. Very. Glenn Norman Barker was 14. He disappeared on March 21st, 1980, and found alongside Russell Dwayne Rue on March 23rd, 1980, in Orange County. He was raped, beaten, assaulted with an ice pick, burned with a lit cigarette, and fatally strangled. And then we have Russell Dwayne Rue, who was 15. He was disappeared on March 21st, 1980, and found alongside Glenn Norman Barker on March 23rd, 1980. He was strangled to death with ligature, and he was assaulted. Well, you actually put the two of them at the same time. It's terrible. Or. It's very close in time. Yeah. Harry Todd Turner was 15. He disappeared on March 25th, 1980, and was found the next day in L.A. He was sodomized, bit, beaten, bludgeoned, and fatally strangled with his own T-shirt. Yikes. Stephen John Wood was 16. He disappeared and was also found on April 4th, 1980 in L.A., and he was strangled to death with ligature. Darren Lee Kendrick was 19. He disappeared on April 29th, 1980, and was found on May 1st, 1980 in L.A. He was forced to drink hydrochloric acid and then was fatally stabbed in the ear with an ice pick by accomplice Vernon Butts after being chemically poisoned by Bonnet. Oh my God, that is horrific. Horrific. God, ugh. Terrible. That is the worst. Is anything with the ice pick just like... I mean, it's all terrible, but my goodness, he really... Uh, the, the ice pick just gives me the heaps. Oh, fair enough. And then we have Lawrence Eugene Sharp, who was 17. He disappeared on May 10th and was found eight days later in Orange County. He was beaten and killed by strangulation. Then there was Sean Page King, who was 14. He disappeared on May 19th, 1980, and was found the next day in San Bernardino County, where he was raped and killed by strangulation. And finally, we have Stephen J. Wells, who was 18. He disappeared on June 2nd, 1980, and was found the next day in L.A. County. He was raped, beaten, and fatally strangled with his own T-shirt. And you can tell some of those weren't done by... Bonin and Bonin yeah. because they weren't all raped. And that seemed to be his MO was that was an absolute of his yeah. choice. So clearly his associates were 
just as guilty. Yeah. So those are just a list of the victims that we know of. Who knows if there's more out there, but it's all just horrific. Yes, very, very, very horrific. I'm so sorry, everybody. But my sources were all that's interesting. Crime Wire, Criminal Minds, Wikipedia, and Reddit. Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Oh. <laughs> it was Criminal Minds Wikipedia. It's an ode to Ashley. Different. <laughs> it's an ode to Ashley for this episode. It's different. That's what they all say. <sighs> so that's those really sucky. I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah, I really bring you down for the beginning of October and Halloween, don't we? Yeah, so happy introduction to spooky season, everybody. We're so sorry. Although, isn't the first on a Sunday? Yes, it is. Oh, so this is coming out in spooky season. It is. And we also have a Friday the 13th in October oh, because of that. That's so exciting. God. I know. Uh, do you remember when we went on a haunted walk like years ago? The investigation, it was on Friday the 13th. Yes. Oh my gosh, it was so good, you guys. And you're going out on a little event on the 14th, which is the day 16th? after. No, 14th is a Friday. I'm going on the 14th? <laughs> Whoa, I didn't know that. Unless you're going to go out on Monday. No. When am I going? Oh, shit. It's not on my calendar, guys. Okay. Well, I'm going on a spooky thing at some point this year. That she doesn't know of. <laughs> I have it in my calendar, ironically. <laughs> I put it in my calendar. Um, I don't know why it's not in my calendar, but I put it in my calendar. Oh, I'm going on the day after. Yes. God. I'm so pumped. Okay, anyways, I'm super pumped for this shit. So close to the 13th. One of my best friends and I are going, and I love her. She listens to the podcast. Hi, Josie. Yes, hi, Josie. <laughs> and the only reason I'm not going is because uh, I laugh too much. Yeah, he's rude. Sorry. He's the only one that experiences spooky shit, but he laughs and is just, he thinks it's funny. There's reason for that. Freaking jerk. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, I have jokes for you. Oh, good. Let's don't, lighten up the mood. Don't look. Oh, sorry. You can't look. I'll close my eyes. Okay. Kyle, mm -hmm. did, did you hear about the fire at the shoe factory? No. Unfortunately, many souls were lost. <laughs> Indeed. What, what, do you, what do you call a pig who knows how to use a knife? <laughs> I don't know. A pork chop. <laughs> That's that old one of the, what do you tell, what, what do you call a pig that knows karate? A pork chop. Exactly. Same thing. <laughs> Why did the pony ask for a glass of water? I don't know. Because he was a little horse. Oh, God. Should have known that one. <laughs> Is there anything worse than when it's raining cats and dogs? Not that I'm aware of. Hailing taxis. <laughs> God. Ah! Oh, I don't, ah, I, don't, ah, I, don't ah. I don't know how to guess any of these. Ah. Um, okay, last one. Okay. My manager told me to have a good day, so I didn't go into work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be a good day most times. Although I really love my new job, so. Oh, that's... and I love my job, to be honest, so. Yeah. I love going in. But anyways. Yeah. For all those people that don't, <laughs> you think that funny. Yeah. Her. Well... Uh, thank you for listening to us. I know we're a bit chaotic because Kyle doesn't know how to Do podcast. So, but we love him anyways. Thank so, you. yeah, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok when Ashley's feeling better and we have video again. And Patreon. We have a smoked ham level and we have an episode that comes out at the first of every month. And it's amazing. And you get to vote on what you want to hear about. And it's so much fun. So come join us over there. It's only $3. Super affordable. And helps us out. And we will love you for it. And if you want to rate and review us, you can do so on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And Kyle, do you have anything to say on your maybe last episode? Oh, my maybe last episode. I don't know if it's your last episode. You might have one more next week. Okay. Well, I appreciate the people that did actually listen and didn't hate on me. I'll, I'll be happy for that. And hopefully they'll continue listening to the two wonderful ladies that uh, have been able to bring this for as long as they have. Yeah. We look forward to bringing you two new stories next week. Bye. Bye.